Hello, everyone. Philip Lee returning with another episode of Civil War Chat. And today is Tuesday, the 5th of April, 2022. Our topic today is canceling Douglas Southall Freeman. Uh, University of Richmond wants to do that. But uh, before we do that, I want to uh, bring to your attention. We ask that you join us in our fight to defeat the cultural genocide that the political left is trying to sweep across the South. We don't ask for donations, but do suggest that you buy our books to learn facts that you can rarely learn elsewhere. Join us in that fight. Buy our books, read them, and if you like them, give them five-star ratings at Amazon. Here's the one I want to recommend today. Trading with the Enemy. This is the story of trading interbelligerent trade between the North and the South during the Civil War. The Civil War essential, uh, essential curriculum of Virginia Tech University has selected this as the single best book on that topic. The important thing to keep in mind here is that the North bought twice as much cotton from the South during the war as went through the maritime blockade to Europe. There, this is not. This is a dark history, particularly from the northern point of view, that uh, today's academics they generally don't want to tell, and and that's why I say get our books to learn facts that you won't learn elsewhere. If you want to get an autographed copy, this will be twenty nine dollars from me directly. Email me Phil P H I L underscore Lee L E I G H at me M E dot com. I think it's twenty six dollars on Amazon. So go ahead and get it get it there at the Amazon if you don't want an autographed copy. Okay, the University of Richmond is canceling one of its most distinguished graduates, Douglas Southall Freeman, who lived from eighteen eighty six to nineteen fifty three. Specifically, they are dropping his name from Mitchell Freeman Hall. After earning a PhD at John Hopkins, he went to uh, University of Richmond for undergrad, then he got a PhD at John Hopkins. Freeman joined the Richmond Times Dispatch in 1909. And in 1915, at the age of 29, he became editor of the Richmond News Leader, a position he held for 34 years. Now, during those years, he wrote a four volume biography of Robert E. Lee a four volume study of General Lee's lieutenants and finished two volumes of a seven volume biography on George Washington. He completed four more volumes of the Washington biography after retirement, whereas two of his associates finished the seventh volume after his death. The Lee and Washington biographies won Pulitzer Prizes. And Lee's lieutenants put Freeman into a close circle of military friends, including leaders like Generals George Marshall and Dwight Eisenhower. If there ever can be a last word on Robert E. Lee or George Washington or the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, Freeman's work has it. His work ethic was legendary. He kept, he kept a demanding schedule that allowed him to accomplish a great deal in his two full-time careers as a journalist and historian. He rose at three o'clock every morning to drive to his office. Twice daily, he walked to a radio station where he gave news broadcasts and analysis. After the second broadcast, he would drive home for lunch, take a short nap, and then start working on another, uh, another five or six hours on one of his current historical projects. There could hardly be a finer role model for the success of success through self-discipline. Nonetheless, the University of Richmond is throwing him under the bus because he, quote, was in favor of racial segregation, the eugenics movement, and the poll tax, and opposed interracial marriage, close quote. No elaboration on the accusations is readily available from the school or the, quote, naming principles commission, close quote, it is hiding behind. Nonetheless, concerning opposition to interracial marriage, it may be said that the vast majority of Americans, white and black, 
disapproved of interracial marriage during Freeman's lifetime that ended in 1953. As late as 1968, 15 years after his death, 75% of whites and 73% of blacks disapproved of interracial marriage. That's from Forbes magazine. Moreover, his newspaper editorials took a moderate stance on race relations and opposed the political machine of Senator Harry F. Byrd, who was one of the South's most vocal proponents of racial segregation from the 1940s to the 1960s. As for the poll tax, some sources have falsely reported that it applied only to Blacks. In truth, it applied to any citizen in Virginia or the other states that had them, any citizen wanting to vote, white or Black. If it was a discriminatory burden, it was a burden segregated by economic class, not race. And that was at a time when many Virginia black whites were poor, and even more of the Southerners across the South were poor, a higher percentage than even in Virginia. Right, you know, as late as 1938, the half the sharecroppers were white, and the typical earnings, if they did it, had a good day, white or black. The economic outlook was this, the economic performance was the same. They earned about 25 cents a day if they were lucky. Moreover, voters were often able to get a political party to pay the dollar fifty poll tax fee for them if they would pledge to vote for the paying party's candidate. As for Freeman's support of eugenics. I cannot categorically deny it. I do not know if he did, if it, if it is true or to what extent he did endorse it. I can't deny it because I can't, I find so little information about it. And this so-called naming commission, which is a, as one, <laughs> one wise man once said, a committee is a horse, a, commi a, a camel is a horse de designed by committee. Okay, nonetheless, as far as eugenics is concerned, among the supporters during Freeman's lifetime were President Theodore Roosevelt, John D. Rockefeller Jr., Helen Keller, and Alexander Graham Bell, among many others. Additionally, few American eugenics supporters took it to the extreme of California. Beginning under the leadership of Attorney General Ulysses Webb, who was in office from 1902 to 1937, 35 years, the doctrine led the state of California to sterilize thousands of its citizens. The last sterilization was in the year before the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And isn't it ironic that the 1964 Civil Rights Act was targeted at the South, but the sterilizations were going on in California? Nah, we don't need to pay attention to that. Okay, um, that's, my, that's my message for today again. If you want to help uh, defeat the cultural genocide that is sweeping across the South, get the facts. And this, this book, Trading with the Enemy, will tell you what happened when, when the Northerners bought cotton during the war and enabled the South to use that money to buy weapons to fight the Northern soldiers. Okay, that's our show for today. And I want to th oh, thank you for watching. If you like my books, forgot to mention, if you like my books, please give them five-star ratings at Amazon. Again, thanks for watching. See you next time.